the belief was that when sanctions were put in place against Russia, that there would be a big enough impact that Vladimir Putin would pull his troops out of Ukraine. That obviously has not occurred till now. And in fact, there's some data which suggests that the sanctions put in place by the U.S. and Europe may actually have emboldened the relationship between Russia and China, as well as maybe giving a boost to the Russian currency, the ruble. Bill Campbell is Portfolio Manager in International Fixed Income with Investment Fund Double Line. He has put together a paper on this, and he joins us to discuss it. Bill, a pleasure to have you with us. Good morning. Good morning, Dan. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. So take us through this uh, from the from the outside, because your belief is that realistically these sanctions have not done the job that they have needed to and in some degrees have boosted uh, Russia's elements. Yeah. So um, I think it, 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 uh, it I think starting the conversation, it makes sense to maybe take a step back and look at Russia's position in the globe. Uh, you know, over the past couple of decades, Russia has made uh, a lot of efforts to become a strategic supplier of commodities to uh, countries both Western and Eastern. And, uh, you know, not just the commodities that we think of, of oil and natural gas, but also of food, agriculture, metals. And, uh, you know, they have uh, in, in uh, securing this position you know, they've become, uh, you know, a key, um, they found themselves as a key member in the global supply chain. So when the sanctions were put on, uh, you know, the idea was, well, uh, cutting Russia off from uh, global trade, cutting Russia off from global finance will cripple the economy and will cause uh, Vladimir Putin to have to, you know, rethink his geopolitical strategy. But when we look at the sanctions, the way they were implemented, they immediately carved out energy. So to be sure, you know, when we're looking at the Russian economy, uh, there is a economic cost being felt by these sanctions. Uh, Russia was removed from the SWIFT system, this uh, global payments messaging system, basically saying that Russian banks can't interact, interact with international banks that kind of cut off the ability for Russia to import goods from the rest of the world, and that's caused a severe contraction uh, in their economy, but not quite as bad as what was expected. But on the flip side of the trade coin, on the export side, uh, most of the commodities that Russia is exporting are necessities, especially in Europe. And not only have we seen the continued flow and transactions in these key commodities, we've actually seen the prices of those commodities increase. The net impact of this is that we've seen fiscal revenues to Russia rise. After an, an initial sell-off in the currency, because the markets expected sanctions to work in the way that they normally work for most countries, uh, what ended up happening is the Russian central bank told its commodity exporting companies that, you know, all of the profits that they were making post the invasion, 80 percent of those needed to be repatriated with the Russian central bank. What mm -hmm. that did is it caused a demand for rubles and there was no supply there. <clears throat> Russia being cut off uh, on the import side uh, from the global financial system, uh, you know, removed the demand of Russians to buy dollars or euros. And then the Russian energy exporters started selling dollars and euros to buy back their rubles. And today we actually see the Russian ruble trading at higher levels than it was pre-invasion, both against the dollar and the euro. And these currency impacts actually are pretty uh, big headwinds to uh, you know the globe, but especially to uh, all the European economies. So obviously the, the when you're talking about this scenario, a lot of people do go, right to the energy component because of uh, the natural gas and, and as well the oil component and and uh, and what the impact could be on Europe when you look at Europe because they have relied on on these energy components and they don't easily have uh, you know other options in there what's the outlook it's it, it's not promising in, in the short term right now 
I, I completely agree with you, Dan. Uh, you know, Europe kind of uh, put itself in, you know, really a bad position, uh, you know, with the implementation of the sanctions with the, you know, without really thinking through the strategic need that they had, especially on the energy side. And, uh, you know, that's caused a, you know, a massive spike in energy prices and a reduction uh, in uh, Europe's ability to, uh, you know, be able to um, lift their energy storage levels over the summer into the winter season. Now, this is important because uh, the gas storage levels, uh, you know, really need to get up to about 80 to 90 percent uh, in order yep. for, uh, you know, northern Europeans to be able to, uh, you know, heat their houses and uh, to be able to use electricity through the winter months. Um, right now, uh, storage levels stand at about 70 percent, which, you know, interestingly is in line with kind of what historical averages are. But Russia has started to reduce the supply that they are providing to these northern European countries in order to in order to put more pressure on them to, you know, uh, try to ease off on the sanctions. Now, what this is doing is it's causing European growth, uh, you know, to face severe headwinds. It's causing inflation to be at historic highs. And it really, in the near term, doesn't look like there's any end in sight, uh, you know, for, you know, this uh, trajectory of slower growth and higher inflation. And what we can also uh, kind of toss into this, you know, horrible mix is uh, right now Northern Europe is facing a drought. We're seeing reductions, yeah. uh, you know, in the Rhine, uh, you know, uh, in water levels in uh, a major transportation river in Germany, the Rhine River, to the point where, uh, you know, barges may not be able to pass through. Uh, also, uh, you know, there are droughts in, Nor uh, in Norway. Norway provides a lot of electricity, uh, you know, to northern Europe, especially to Germany. Uh, Sixty percent of Norway's electricity production is hydro, uh, you know, hydroelectric. So they're talking about cutting off energy, uh, you know, exports that they give uh, to northern Europe, too. So that's going to put further pressure, uh, you know, both on electricity prices and on growth. Yeah. And, you know, I think the outlook just in the near term is, uh, you know, is fairly challenged. That being said, uh, you know, maybe we can get into uh, a little bit later. Uh, I do think, you know, some medium term opportunities are starting to present themselves. But the near term remains extremely challenged. Well, we got about three minutes left. So let me jump quickly into another question I wanted to ask you about was because you also have to factor in the relationship between Russia and China and to a, to a degree India as well in terms of the support and opportunity that those two countries are providing for Russia throughout this process. Right. So I think the sanctions have provided, uh, you know, a two-tiered oil system where India and China have noticed an opportunity to be able to secure new energy supplies, uh, you know, at much more favorable rates. I think that, you know, this is creating, especially with the Russia-China axis, uh, you know, a new economic and financial pull in the world away from just that dollar block, dollar European pull. Uh, we're seeing the Russian central bank start to increase their holdings of uh, Chinese yuan in their FX currency basket. We have seen uh, at the Olympics, uh, Vladimir Putin and President Xi Jinping from China sign an agreement to increase the build out of energy pipelines between Russia into China to try to supply energy and, uh, you know, more specifically to take energy from the Yamal uh, natural gas fields that pretty much exclusively service Europe and start to divert some of that down through Mongolia to China. I think a lot more of this uh, shift is going to happen. It's going to provide a very interesting opportunity in an in, in infrastructure build out, an energy infrastructure build out through pipelines and refineries and all of the other, you know, items that go into that. Uh, so yeah. for, you know, Countries and companies that supply raw materials, uh, this may be an opportunity in the medium term, as well as, uh, you know, creating a new financial access for people who, uh, you know, there are a lot of countries that have seen the weaponization of, uh, you know, these sanctions on, of Western currencies and, uh, you know, are starting to rethink, you know, how much uh, U.S. dollar holdings that they would like to have in their currency reserve baskets. And now, the uh, you know movement of you know Russia and China to a closer economic and financial uh, orbit is starting to give countries 
you know, the potential for a diversifier, uh, you know, in that uh, in that basket in, in trade relationships and, uh, you know, in financial ties. About 45 seconds, Bill, then are, are there one or two areas that either the U.S. or Europe needs to focus on now to try and turn this around a little bit and have more of an impact on Russia? I, I mean, it, the, they need to. T- the, the bottom line is they need to be able to cut off uh, a lot more of the uh, energy exports, but it's going to come at a tremendous economic cost to Europe. Uh, so if we can get, uh, you know, a lot more, uh, you know, liquid natural gas, uh, you know, via shipments uh, from the United States and from the Middle East to Europe, uh, potentially we could offset that. But unfortunately, yeah. I think near term it comes at an economic cost. Bill, great to have you with us. Let's uh, do this again down the road and expand this discussion. Thanks very much. All the best. All right. Thanks, Dan. Bill Campbell, Portfolio Manager and International Fixed Income with Double Line.